pleasure to welcome Francesco Rebola here. I would like to read his CV, but I find that I know everything about his CV, so you can start from ahead. The first time I met Francesco was in 2012 in TTIC in Chicago. He was a researcher. I was much younger, I was still a student. He was already like much more experienced. Afterwards, basically, he moved to Yahoo Research. Basically, he will he be an extenuous researcher there, right? In Yahoo Research. Senior research. Senior research, okay. Afterwards, he moved to Stony Brook. We got some grant together from NSF focusing on data science and machine learning. Afterwards, he moved to Stony, Stony Brook, then he moved to Boston University. And now he's associate professor there. He also got some big award from Kairis NSF Kairi Grant. And it's, he'll be speaking about parameter optimization or anything else what he's focusing on. Please, Francesco. Okay, so yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Maybe I'll possibly tell you some, something about my work. Uh, so let, let me first say a few words about me and that uh, things that Martin didn't cover. Uh, I am actually in between the applied and the theoretical work because I did my PhD in robotics. Uh, and uh, this ugly setup that you can see in the photo here is the robot that I used during my PhD. Um, but then after my PhD, I sort of moved towards computer vision and machine learning. And this is from one of my papers. It was about classifying X-ray images. And we won with that technique two, two years in a row a competition of classifying. Uh, X-ray images, but then after computer vision, I switched to machine learning, and in these days, basically, I do mainly machine learning and optimization. Uh, and so, but my my topics are a little bit, you know, between all these things, between robotic, computer vision, machine learning, online learning, optimization, and statistics. There is a little bit of everything uh, in uh, in my in my work. Now. Let me tell you what is the motivation, not only of this talk, but of what everything that I do. If you think about it, optimization is at the core of all the deep learning algorithms that we use. At the end of the day, we always have to optimize something. If it is the training error, test error, or some energy function, it's always an optimization problem. However, there is a sad truth that no theoretical principled algorithm de developed by you know, optimization people are actually used in deep learning. None of them. Now, uh, why is this the case? I would argue that there is too much distance between the theory world and the applied world. And what I do in my research, I try to uh, reduce this gap. And this is true for things that I do in optimization, but this is true for everything else that I do in my research. So this is an outline of the thing that I will tell you today. In the first, in the first half of the talk, I will tell, uh, tell you something about this parameter-free approach to optimization. And in the second part of the talk, instead, I will tell you something about unbounded smoothness and algorithms that are able to adapt this unbounded smoothness. And these are just two directions of my work that I think um, show you a little bit of what, what I do. And finally, I will conclude with future direction with things that I would like to do in, in the future years. So let's start with the first part, parameter free. Uh, the setting is very easy. Uh, as I said, everything boils down to optimization. So everything boils down to finding the minimum of a function. Okay. And for simplicity, let's assume that the function is convex just because it makes all the theory very easy. But uh, there are ways even to extend this theory even to non convex functions, or at least to a class of non convex functions. Now, uh, I will uh, assume that we have access to unbiased noisy estimates of the gradients. Let's call them GT. And what I mean by that very practically is that every time, for example, we calculate the, the gradients on a mini batch, that is exactly an unbiased noise estimate of your gradient. Uh, I will assume that the, the, these gradients, these stochastic gradients here, are bounded in norm by some quantity big G. And what is the algorithm that I want to focus on? I want to focus on stochastic gradient descent. That is the algorithm that 99% of the people used in machine learning in these days. Now, stochastic gradient descent, it's a very simple algorithm, almost dumb in a certain sense. Uh, what it's doing is that in each time step, you are moving in the negative direction of the stochastic gradient. 
multiplied by some learning rates. This eta here is called the learning rates. That basically tells you by how much you should jump each time. Now, this eta is the critical hyperparameter. If you don't choose it in the right way, the algorithm will just not work. So why choosing the learning rate is so, so difficult? Let me show you pictorially. Uh, let's say that you want to minimize a very simple function, the absolute value of x minus 10. Okay, this is a very simple one-dimensional convex function. So you want to find the minimum here. So you use stochastic gradient descent. You have to start somewhere. Let's say that you start from zero. And every time you evaluate the subgradient, and it, this, the gradient basically tells you only you should go right. Right, because you start from zero. This is the only thing that it tells you, but it doesn't tell you about how much you should go in that direction. And so if you use a learning rate that is too small, it should be very intuitive that it will take forever to reach the optimum. On the other hand, if you choose a learning rate that is too large, you will quickly reach the area of the optimum, but then you will never converge because you cannot be more precise than the learning rate. Now, you might think that, you know, this is a very simple problem. You might use a strategy like line search that basically tells you by how much you should jump optimally. But this would work only in this one dimensional case. Already in two dimensions, it will not work anymore. And even in the stochastic setting, it's even worse because you don't have the true gradient. You just have an estimate of it. So you cannot really use line search. Uh, now, what about all these adaptive algorithms that people use in deep learning, like Adam, Adagrand, and, and all these algorithms that cl they claim to be adaptive? Let's see what they would do. This is, for example, Adagrand. It's not really adapting to anything, if you actually look at it. The only thing that would happen is that now the jumps would become smaller and smaller over time. And that's it. This is the only thing that Adagrand would do. And so the advantage now is that you sooner or later you actually converge because the jumps become arbitrarily small, but you still have to decide the initial jump that will determine all the others. And so you still have an hyperparameter, you still have a learning rate, you still have to tune something in other. Now let's look at it from a theory point of view. From a theory point of view, let's say that x zero is your starting point and x star is the best solution. And G is again the norm on, on the, uh, the bound on the norm of the stochastic gradients. The theory tells you that the optimal learning rate is this one. Now let's parse it. Basically, it says the learning rate should depend on the distance between the optimal solution and the initial point. This is very intuitive. I am if I am far from the, in the, the optimal solution, I should take bigger jumps. If I am closer to it, I should take smaller jumps. And then, of course, I should be the learning rate should be proportional to the number of iterations that I do and to the Lipschitz constant of the, of the function. Now, this is the optimal learning rate. So this means that if you use it, you will obtain the optimal convergence rate. There is a problem in it. You don't know x star. You don't know x star because you're looking for it. If you knew where x star were, there was no reason to run the optimization problem in the first place. And so this is only good only from a theoretical point of view, but it's not something that you can actually use. So what actually people do in practice? In practice, you just try all the possible learning rates. You can do you know, uh, uh, with a great search, you can do with Bayesian optimization. At the end of the day, you are just trying a bunch of learning rates and finding the best one. And so to give you a practical example, this is a data set that I took from OpenML. This is a regression data set. I just did linear regression, absolute loss, one pass over the data set. And I tried all the possible learning rate with stochastic gradient descent and with Adagrad. And I evaluated the test loss. And you can see that, yeah, Adagrad is not really adapting in any way. There is an optimal learning rate. How do you find it? You just try all of them. And there is basically no advantage over SGD, apart from the fact that if you tune it, it will be better. But you still have to tune it. So can we do better than this? And actually, yes. And one way to do better than this is with this class of algorithms that we call parameter-free. Okay. So let me show you how these parameter-free algorithms work. And let me show you using uh, a coin betting point of view. Okay. This is a slightly different from what optimization people, uh, uh, the way optimization people usually design optimization algorithms. But in the end, it makes the analysis of this kind of algorithms very, very easy. And so this is the preferred way that I use to explain it. 
So first I will, I have to explain you what is this coin betting game. This is a very simple game. You are betting money on a coin that can be head on or tail and you want to make, you want to make a lot of money. That's it. So each time you tell me on which side of the coin and you tell me how much money you bet. Then I flip the coin, I tell you what was the side. If it is the right side, you win money. If it is the wrong side, you lose money. Okay? You win one to one. You cannot borrow money. So you can only bet as many, as many money as you have currently. And let me use some notation here. Uh, the, the, the outcome of the coin will be called CT. And if it is head, we say that CT is equal to one. If it is tail, we, we say that is minus one, okay? The, the amount of money that you're betting is called XT. And we code into it how much money you want to bet, but also the side of the coin, okay? So if XT is positive, we say that you are betting on hand. If it is negative, you're betting on the other side. So that the wealth will be uh, at the end of the round T will be equal to the amount of money that you had at the beginning of the round, plus how much money you're betting multiplied by the coin. So that if in this way they have the same sign, this means that you're betting on the right side, this means that you win money. If they have different signs, this means that you're betting on the wrong side, so you're losing the money that you were betting. Okay. Now, the aim of the game is that you want to win. You want to make as much, as much money as possible. Of course, given that I didn't tell you how the outcomes of the coins are generated, in general, you cannot win money in this game in every possible situation. And so let's, let's be a little bit more specific. You want to win money every time the number of heads and number of tails are different in the sequence. So if the coin is a little bit unbalanced towards one of the two sides, you want to take advantage of it and win a lot of money. Okay. Now, it turns out this is a very old problem. You can solve it optimally in a certain sense. Uh, this is a very old algorithm. And by the way, you can solve it in many different ways, but the algorithm that I will describe to you is the simplest strategy. And this is called Krecheski Trofimov Better by the name of the two others. It basically says in round T, you bet a sign fraction of your money that is equal to the sum of the coins in the past divided by the number of rounds plus one. Okay, this is just a number. This is just a number between minus one and one. And it tells you at the same time on which side of the coin you have to bet because it has a sign. And also what is the fraction of the money that you should bet. Now, if you use this strategy, you can show that deterministically, the amount of money that you make is exponential every time the, the coin is biased towards one of the two sides. Okay, why it is exponential? Here you have the sum of the coins. And if the one of those two sides is appearing more often than the others, this sum here will be proportional to capital T. So you have capital T squared divided, divided by capital T, so you get X of capital T. So the amount of money that you're making is exponential over time, okay? And again, deterministically. What is this other factor, two times square root of T? This is the price that you have to pay for the fact that you don't know in advance how many heads and how many tails there are in the entire sequence. So this is the price for not knowing the future. Okay. Now, yes. Could you maybe step one step further? So can I ask again? Yes, but then I don't see the slides anymore, but that's okay. What do you see this? Oh, okay, you will not see this. I can see the slides here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let me stress the fact that there are no assumptions on the coin for, for these uh, for whoa, for these inequality to be true. This is always true regardless of how the coins outcomes are generated. Okay, it might seem a little bit weird, but this is deterministically true, always. And you can also show that the result is optimal in a certain sense, because uh, the, the only thing that you can improve is the factor of two. Everything else is optimal. Now, uh, this means that this game is solvable in a certain sense. So this, in the sense that you can always win money, again, if one side is appearing more often than the other. And if you look at the strategy, the strategy at the same time is extremely simple. This is the only thing that you have to do. And it doesn't have anything to tune. There are no learning rates, no prior, no regularization, no, no whatever other thing that you want to tune in a machine learning model. So what is the connection between these and stochastic random descent? Now, 
everything was known till now. These are old, old results, very old results. My contribution was to show that you can reduce optimization to this game. And once you do that, you can use this algorithm that is optimal and does not have hyperparameters to do optimization. And you recover an algorithm that does optimization without hyperparameters, and it is optimal. So let me show you how to do that. Uh, first, what you want to do is the following. You want to run an optimization algorithm for capital filtration, and you want to return the best point, OK? You can also use other strategy, but for simplicity, let's say that you want to return the best point over all the iterations, the one that is as the minimal value. Remember, you are minimizing a function. So what you're doing is this, you're basically looking at the difference between the function in all the points that you're generated and the function in the optimal, and you're taking the minimum here, and you want this difference to go to zero when the number of iteration goes to infinity. Okay, so you want to converge to the optimal. Now, this thing immediately is less than the average for the simple reason that a minimum, it's always less than the average over any series. The next step in these proofs, it's always the same. And is we use the fact that the function is complex. So we can transform the difference between two functions in the inner product between the gradients and the difference between the iterates and the optimal. Now, this quantity here, this sum here, it's what in online learning we call the regret or linearized regret. Okay, it's not really important why we call it regret, but this important thing is that this is the quantity that we want to be small. So if we want to show that if we want to show that the algorithm is converging, we can show that the regret is growing sublinearly in time because then you divide by capital T, and so this entire quantity is going to zero with the number of iterations. So you want regret sublinear in time. So you want the regret to be smaller than some function psi capital T quick star. And you want this function to grow sublinear. Now, this is completely, this is a difficult problem. Why is it a difficult problem? Because you don't know X star. This is exactly the place that makes everything complex. Remember, you cannot tune the learning rate because you don't know X star. X star is the unknown thing. Now there is the trick. The trick is the following. I showed eight years ago, and this is by now a standard result in online learning. That basically says that every time you want to show that the regret is less than a function psi t of x star, this is completely equivalent to show this other inequality. This other inequality still has gradient, still has x of t. So this is basically the same quantities that are appearing here, but there is no x star on this side of the inequality anymore. The optimal point disappeared completely. And what is the other term here? This is the functional conjugate of the function psi evaluated on the sum of the gradients. Now, this is the functional conjugate. It's not super important to know what is the functional conjugate. The important thing is that a functional conjugate is a transformation of convex function. You can take a function, you can transform it through the functional conjugate, you obtain another function, and then you can go back, you can transform again, and again you obtain the function, the initial function. So Again, if you want to show that this regret is smaller than a function of ct of x star, in an equivalent term, you can show instead this inequality that is much easier. Why it's much easier to show? Because x star is not present at all. And everything is known here. xt is known, the gradients are known, so you know everything for this easier problem. I have to say here in the middle. Okay, you really don't have to look at the slides. Okay. Is this clear? Is there is any question? This is sort of, you know, the, the most important and also the only technical question of all, all the technical slide of the talk. The rest will be easier. Okay, so the main message is that we wanted to solve a problem. This problem was difficult because there are things that you don't know, but you can show that there is an equivalent problem in which you know everything. Okay, so now let me show you that starting from this problem here, what is the connection between this problem and betting? This is again what, what, what I showed you in the previous slide. You wanted to show that this suboptimality gap here is bounded by some function psi t of x star divided by capital T. And this is equivalent to show this other relationship. Now, let's consider the function that I showed you before, absolute value of x minus 10. Okay, this is exactly the same function as before. And let's set up a betting game out of the optimization problem. Every time the 
uh, the betting algorithm tells you tells you that you should bet xt dollars. That is the point on which you query the gradient. Okay. So if the algorithm tells you you should bet 0.2 dollars, you say xt is equal to 0.2. This is the point on which you query the gradient. Every time you query a gradient, given that this function, the gradients are exactly plus one and minus one, ignore the minimum, but in all the other points it's plus one and minus one, you take minus gradient and that is the outcome of your coin. Okay, so this is the entire betting game. Every time the betting strategy tells you you should bet some amount of money with a sign, remember that the amount of money has a sign, that is the point on which you query the gradient, you get the gradient, the gradient, you, you invert the sign, that is the outcome of the coin. Now you see if you win or lose money, right? Because you're betting. Then you see how much money you have. Then you see how much, uh, how, money, how much money you should bet in the next round because the betting strategy tells you what to do in the next round. That is the next point on which you query the gradient and so on. That's it. This is the entire reduction. Now, why this works? Because Kritschewski's Kritophimos tells us that the wealth will increase at least as this amount, this, this exponential function. What is the wealth? The wealth is the initial dollar that you have because you start with a dollar and how much money you made throughout the entire game. That is the sum of how much money you were betting, xt, multiplied by the coin. The coin is minus gradient. So you know that this entire formula here is at least this exponential quantity. And what is, look at this part here, this sum of gradient xt. This is exactly this part. So in order to show that the algorithm was working, you had to show that this quantity here with the minus was at least some function of the minus the gradient. And this is exactly what Krzyzewski tells you. This function here is at least this exponential function of the sum of the gradients. That's it, you have it. You have it immediately from the fact that Krzyzewski tells you that you gain enough money. Now, the only thing that you have to do in order to convert this thing into the convergence rate is that you calculate the financial conjugate of this function. So you have to calculate the financial conjugate of this exponential function. You plug it here and you get the convergence rate. That's it. Okay. Now, let me try to convince you. It might not be immediate, especially for people that don't know optimization by heart, why this is a good convergence rate. Let me convince you that this is a good one. So first, let me show you what is the algorithm? We are assuming that the gradients are exactly plus one or minus one, and we are using Krzyzewski Trofimov. So how much money we bet is a fraction of the money that you have, and the fraction is calculated as the sum of the coins in the past divided by number of rounds plus one. Now, coins are minus gradients, and the, the amount of money that you have is the initial dollar and how much money you make. So is the money that you bet multiplied by the coins that are minus gradients. So this is the entire update. So you can see that first, this is as simple as stochastic gradient descent. It's not stochastic gradient descent. It doesn't have a learning rate. It doesn't even jumps as stochastic gradient descent. It does something else. But if you can implement stochastic gradient descent, you can also implement this one. Now, this thing, the, it might seem weird because we are in 1D and it, all, it works only if the gradients are plus one or minus one. But let me tell you immediately that this extends to any number of dimensions, Hilbert spaces, even Banach spaces with a slightly different reduction. Uh, and the only thing that we need is that the gradients are bounded, so the function is Lipschitz. And the only thing that will change here is that here now you have inner products between these are vectors. And in the convergence rate, you have a norm because now this is a vector, but everything is the same. So this works, you can use it whenever you want, not only on one dimensional functions. Now, let me convince you that this is a good convergence rate. Let me rewrite it. Okay, so this is, this is the convergence rate. Let me rewrite it in this other way. This is exactly the same convergence rate as before, but I wrote it in a variational form so that if you minimize over alpha this formula, you get the formula before. Okay, it's just a different way to write the same thing. Why I should write it in this way? Because let me compare it with the convergence rate that you get from gradient descent. In gradient descent, you can use a learning rate that is alpha over square root of t. What is alpha? Alpha is exactly that small number that you have to tune, the one in which you have to try all of them until you find the right one. And you look at the convergence rate, and the convergence rate will depend on alpha. Now, let's compare it with the one that you get from my algorithm. They are the same, but there is a critical difference. 
in gradient descent, alpha is the parameter that you have to tune. In my algorithm, alpha is not a parameter. I just rewrote this thing as the minimum of alpha to show you that these two things are the same. But somehow, basically, in my algorithm, you get the performance of gradient descent as if you were able to tune alpha optimally, but for free. Not exactly for free, by the way. There is a price that you pay. And the price is this logarithmic term here. That is exactly the price for not knowing in advance what is the optimal learning rate. Now, some people might be concerned that you, know, you get a log t here so that you screw up the asymptotic rate. But if you change the algorithm a little bit, you can get log of norm of the optimal solution. And so you don't even lose that logarithmic term. It's just a constant. Now, let me show you what this algorithm does in practice. Okay. In practice, Crichet's cryptography in the first iteration tells you you should bet a fraction of your mind that is equal to the sum of the coins in the past divided by number of rounds plus one. First rounds, there is no past. So in the first iteration, Krishnevsky Trofimo tells you, you should bet zero money because you don't know anything about the coin. Let's just not bet. So bet equal to point on which you query the gradient. So zero money correspond to say, first point is X equal to zero. So this means that you start from here. This is the first point in which you query the gradient. You query the gradient, the gradient is a minus one. Gradient is equal to minus coin. So the first coin is one. Okay, second round, Krzyzewski tells you, you should bet 50 cents on observing a one, because this is the only thing that we saw in the past. And so money that you bet is equal to iterate. So 0 0.5, you are here. And what happens when you are here that you get another gradient and it's the same as before. So the coin is the same as before. So this means that you won your bet and you will keep winning your bet for a while. And given that you are using that algorithm that tells you that if the coin is skewed, you win an exponential amount of money. This means that you are moving exponentially fast from the initial points towards the optimum. At a certain point, you will overshoot, of course. And what happens here that you observe a gradient of the different side. You will still betting on observing always the same coin. And here you got the other coin, the other side of the coin. Here you lost your bet. So this means that you lost a, lo a lot of money and money is equal to point in which you query the gradient. So this means that in the next iteration, you out the algorithm automatically will sort of backtrack. And then it will recover. And at a certain point, the algorithm will oscillate back, back and forth around the minimum and then it will converge. So overall, what this algorithm is doing is the following. In the beginning, you, the algorithm is going exponentially fast towards the optimum. And this is different from any other algorithm that any other strategy and people typically use. You know, if you think about deep learning people, they, they, they typically tell you the learning rate should be constant. Or you to keep the learning rate constant and then after a while you decrease it, right? So this is the opposite. This says, no, 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 you should go exponentially fast until you reach the area that is interesting. Once you are there, you decrease the learning rate, you decrease the steps because you want to converge. Okay. But why this is difficult to uh, to implement this, this uh, strategy, because you don't know where is the optimum. If you knew, knew in advance where the optimum was, everything would be easy. But given that you don't know where it is, you have to use some kind of strategy. And this algorithm turns out to use exactly this strategy. And by the way, I want to stress that I never, I never designed the strategy in the algorithm. I just cared about the theory. The, the convergence rate was optimal. And so, the fact that the algorithm is using somehow in a strategy that makes sense is a side effect of the fact that the convergence rate is optimal. Okay. <clears throat> now, let me show you that, you know, this is not uh, just a theoretical thing, but this actually works very well. So I took a bunch of open end ML uh, data sets and I just selected all the biggest ones in terms of features and number of samples, nothing else. I didn't do any other selection. For all, all the regression ones, and for all of them, I did linear regression, absolute loss. And I compared with Adagrad and SGT, and I compared a variant of the algorithm that I showed you. I mean, over the past years, I, I, I designed a lot of parameter-free algorithms. The one that I showed you is sort of the easiest one to explain. 
But there is a variant called pistol that you can think of as the Adagrad version of what I showed you before. And so it's doing this approach, but on each single coordinate. So it's doing bets on each single coordinate. And now for Adagrad and SGD, I tried all the possible learning rates. And for my algorithm, I just run it once. And this is what you get. This is exactly the same data set that I showed you at the beginning. This is one pass over the data set, test loss versus all the possible learning rates. This is the performance of HGD. This is the performance of Adagrad. And the black line is my algorithm. It's a line because you just write, run it once. And you see that you basically get the same performance of a tuned Adagrad, but for free. You just run it once. And this happens over and over and over and over again. And again, these, I didn't select these data sets. You know, it, it just works. And, and in some cases, you even have that the performance of my algorithm is even better than a tuned algorithm. And this can even be explained by the theory. The reason is that in my algorithm, I'm basically implicitly tuning a learning rate for each coordinate. In Adagrad, nobody does that. When you tune Adagrad, what do you do? You tune just one number for all the coordinates, right? And instead, in my algorithm, I have this implicit tuning for all the coordinates, and so I can have even better performance than a tune Adagrad. Now, I know what everybody's thinking. This is convex tasks, right? So this is useless. We should look at deep learning. So the main problem is that the analysis that I showed you, all the theory that I showed you, relies on convexity. Yes. I have one question. Uh, can you go back to the uh, convex function uh, a bit before? Yes, this one. This one. Yes. Yes. So uh, the figure which we are looking at this is like an object uh, loss function, right? right? Right. Yes. So here we are assuming that this x star, which is the minimum point, right? This is constant, right? Like this. Right. This is where we want to reach. Right. But uh, like in practice, we use mini batches, right? Like, right. And so for a particular mini batch, we design, we calculate the loss. Right. So for every mini batch, we will get one figure, right? Not really, not really. The mini batch is still an unbiased estimate of the actual objective function that you're minimizing. So X star is still the same because the objective function is still the same. Every time you get a noisy estimate, of the true gradient, and the mini batch just gives you a noise estimate, but the function is always the same. Yes, but, but, but if you don't calculate the gradient, we just calculate the loss function. Yeah. So the loss, loss function will be you using could, some, some examples, right? Right. You could calculate the loss function in each mini batch. You could do that. We, we do it, right? Right. You, you can even do that, but uh, you can calculate the value of the loss function in each mini batch, but implicitly, you're still minimizing the same function. But by the way, let me tell you something that might be closer to what you care. This entire theory works even in online learning because I do online learning. So I showed you this theory for batch optimization, but actually this works as it is for online learning. In online learning, you don't minimize a single function. You minimize a series of functions that arrive over time. And every time you don't know what is the next one, everything goes through. The theory goes through, you get exactly the same. We can talk, we can talk offline. Yes. But it is in a like case stable <coughs> XR or some There is no concept of X star in online learning because every time you X star is basically the minimizer of the sum of the function that you got till this point. But so we don't have some expectation? No. No. In online learning, there is no stochastic assumption whatsoever. And so there is no concept of X star. You basically what you do, theoretically speaking, you compete with any X. And X might be anything, and you compete with any of them uniformly. So I have a question about uh, go back one slide to the slide of the algorithm, right? So it requires memory that's basically linear in the number of steps or iteration. No, 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 no. This is a sum of vectors. You only have to keep uh, basically this sum. This is a dimension D. This thing is an inner product. You have to keep in, in memory a number. And every time you add an, another number to it, so you keep a vector and a number. So you're keeping them as running sums, is how yes. you implement it. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question about stochastic extension. You, you said uh, uh, that you compared with SGT and other yes. And so there you use uh, stochastic gradients, right? Right. Everything goes through. Yeah. And uh, in, in terms of the analysis, 
everything goes through. The only yeah. difference is that you, 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 you put see. exploitation on both sides. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you have, you, you, do you assume bounded uh, stochastic gradient? I do. Is so, it uh, crucial or it's uh, like mostly for applying this algorithm, like analysis of? It's uh, mostly crucial. Uh, but I have an extension in which I, I assume that the function is Lipschitz, but the noise on top is sub exponential. Yeah. And it's still fine. But the algorithm changes. Yeah. So I think, yeah, basically, uh, and you have an analysis uh, in expectation, right? Yeah. Right. The yeah. analysis in high probability of this kind of algorithm is open. Yeah, because in high probability, you can say that you can, you can prove that. Uh, it, it will be bounded with high probability, and so you, you don't need to assume. Oh, if you do that, the noise is sub exponential. Sure, you can do that. But uh, if you want to do an yeah. analysis of high probability of the actual convergence rates, typically <laughs> you have to show that the iterates are bounded in a certain sense. I mean, also, you, know, you know this kind of analysis. This is very difficult to show for this kind of algorithms because the iterates are moving exponentially fast. And, and this makes the analysis difficult. It might be done. I actually don't know. It might be done, but till now we don't have it. And by the way, the cold paper, the cold paper that I will mention in a while that has obtained similar guarantees, they do have uh, carbon, they do have an high probability analysis, but the algorithm is slightly different. But the guarantees are similar. Okay, so let me go back on the, on the slide on deep learning. Uh, so what we did, we did what everybody does in this field. So we basically say, okay, let's say that the function is not convex, but still not too bad. And let's use the theory just as a hint. And let's design an heuristic variant for deep learning. So I, uh, this is what I did in 2017. I proposed an algorithm called COCOP that was specific for deep learning. So the idea is still exactly the one that I showed you, but I tweaked a little bit the algorithm to make it work for deep learning, minor changes. And now, instead of showing you results, and especially old results, because you know this is an old paper, let me show you a single slide that might be you know, the best way to convince you that these kind of algorithms in the end, they do work. So randomly browsing the internet, I found the GitHub page of this guy that won a Kaggle competition about time series forecasting using LSTMs and my algorithm. And if you read what the motivation why I used my algorithm, he said, you know, I have to try a lot of different things because I'm doing a Kaggle competition. I have to see what works. And I want to save time. And so if I don't have to tune parameters, it's much better. And not only that, he said, not only I don't have to tune stuff, it also converges much faster than the traditional momentum-based optimizers. So it's a win-win situation. And if, you know, if somebody can download the code from internet, not even mail, mail me once asking me how to use it, it just, took it, used it, and it worked, and evolved the competition. This means that, you know, there is something good in this kind of algorithm. And, okay, so what I showed you now is sort of the past, what's going on in this field in the present. There are a bunch of extensions that we can do. For example, differentially private SGD without learning grade, uh, the theory for non-convex non function, for a class of non-convex function called variation coherent, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me conclude this part saying that, you know, what are the things that you should remember? You know, typically people tend to forget the details of the talk, but what is the things that you should remember? If you want to do stochastic optimization of a convex function, non-smooth learning rate are unnecessary. I know that everybody uses them, but they're unnecessary. I mean, we have better algorithms. You don't have to use coin betting algorithms. I mean, you can use whatever other algorithms you like, but just remember that if you're using learning rates, you're using a suboptimal algorithm. And coin betting, I like them because they are easy. I mean, once you enter into the mentality of this, how to design betting algorithms, they're super easy. I mean, I showed you Krzyzewski trophy was super easy. And empirically, they seem very promising on both convex and non-convex functions. Have, have these uh, objective functions also applied on vision tasks, like classification, detection, the loss function, this one? Vision tasks? Yeah, yeah, I mean, at that time I did also experiments on, on vision uh, with ResNet and this kind of things, yes. Which works there as well. Yes, yes. But things are changing in deep learning. So, you know, for example, on transformers, the, the algorithm does not work that well anymore because transformers are different in a certain sense. And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to design the next generation of this, basically. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, does this algorithm adjust uh, automatically to the some good properties of the problem, like strong convexity, smoothness? Because here you assume right. just convexity and smoothness, right. and you obtain the rate. Right. And is it possible to run the same algorithm without right. changing? But it right, 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 okay. right. So if the function is smooth and the gradients are still bounded, then you obtain uh, the the usual uh, the adaptive rate, one over t plus sigma over square root of t. Okay. Let's, easy. let's consider the deterministic case for simplicity. Okay. okay. The deterministic case, then you get one over t. Yes. And if, if you have strong convexity. If you get strong convexity, there is another variant. It's called a cold paper with me and a shock. It's, as far as I know, it's the only algorithm that in the stochastic setting adapts to strong convexity and gets uh, one over lambda t up to logarithmic terms. The logarithmic terms are the price that you pay for the yeah, lambda is strong convexity. Yes. Yeah, and in, in uh, and it also has uh, uh, exponentially. No, in, in the deterministic case, I don't get the linear rate. If you if this is yeah, this is what yes. uh, no. I'm curious about. So like right. to, to have algorithms that adapts. Uh, right, right. I don't know how to do that. It's also open. I might be in the paper of Carmon. Not sure. You can check. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So for fact, it, it, adapt, it adapts to smoothness. Or? Yes, smooth, but the smoothness is easy. Everybody can adapt to smoothness in a certain sense. Strong convexity is the really difficult one. Okay. So let me move to the second part of the talk. I don't know how much I'm doing on time. That's fine. Very late. Okay. No, fifteen minutes. Ten fifteen minutes is fine. Okay. So what is this second part? What is the, the premise for this? Again, people do not use principal algorithms. People use Adam. You know, this is uh, the, the secret recipe for everything. And what is the most annoying thing for theoreticians? The most annoying thing is that in the worst case, stochastic gradient descent and Adam are the same. So we really don't understand why everybody uses Adam or why, let me say it better, why it works so well while in the worst case, it should be the same as SG. Now, this is a very important question, not just because I am a tradition, because if we don't understand what is the secret ingredient in Adam, we cannot design the next generation of optimization algorithms. There is something special in Adam. We have to understand it and improve it. It's a necessary step. So to understand this thing, we should try to understand what are the functions that on which we use Adam. It's not that Adam is good on any function in the world. Adam is good when you use on deep learning objective functions. So what, is, what are the assumptions that people use when they design optimization algorithms for deep learning? Well, they assume smoothness. This is basically 90% of the theory paper, you would see this assumption. What does it mean? It means that the function is differentiable and the gradients are not changing too much. So the gradients is Lipschitz. Why people like to assume that? People like to assume that for two reasons. First, if the function is smooth, the gradient is going to zero when you approach a minima. This is not true for the function that I showed you before, that is not smooth. And so given that in a non-convex function, you cannot show that you converge to the global optimal, at least you show that the gradients are going to zero. And so you have a theorem. And also it makes the analysis particularly easy because the function is upper bounded by quadratic, everything becomes very easy. However, we now know that smoothness is not a good assumption for deep learning objective. And this was showed empirically by this paper by MIT people two years ago. So instead they say there is this other assumption that empirically models better the objective functions of deep learning. So what is this assumption? This says the uh, a uh, biggest eigenvalue of the Hessian is upper bounded by a constant, and this corresponds to smoothness. This, this first part is exactly the same as smoothness, but it has also another term that is proportional to the gradient itself. So what's the meaning of this? The meaning is that the curvature of the function can increase when you are far away from a local minimum. Okay. And why did they decide this, this, uh, this assumption? Again, they measured it empirically. This is true. So we should use it. Now, let me simplify it immediately, this formulation a little bit. In another paper, by the way, these are two different junk. This is a completely different group. They show that you can simplify this assumption that you can make it a little bit weaker in this way so that it becomes similar to smoothness. You have, again, difference of gradients. Again, you have a constant term, but now you have this additional term here that depends on gradients. 
So that if L1 is equal to zero, you get classic smoothness, otherwise you get something weird. And this assumption is called L0, L1 smoothness. Now, why we should use it? There are a bunch of functions that are not smooth, but there are L0, L1 smooth. For example, all the univariate polynomials like x to the four, that seems a very nice function, is not smooth, but it is L0, L1 smooth. The exponential function also, it's pretty nice, but it's not smooth, but it's L0, L1 smooth. But more importantly, this assumption holds empirically. And so in particular, they show that it holds every time you use LSTMs. So the first thing that we did was to say, does this, this assumption holds for transformers? No, in these days, everybody's using transformers. And it does. So we measured the smoothness with respect to the gradient on two different tasks on a transformer. And you know, if the smoothness assumption is true, you would expect the smoothness to be uniformly bounded independent of the gradient. And instead, you get here, it's almost proportional. The smoothness is almost proportional to the gradient. And here it's less clear, but the important thing is that it's still upper bounded, it's clear, the smoothness is still upper bounded by a line that is proportional to the gradient. So everything is below a line, okay? So the assumption is still true, even in transformers. And what people showed before, people showed that for this class of functions, you should use clipping. Why you should use clipping? Because for this class of functions, the gradients can be really, really large. Think about exponential. If you take the gradients of an exponential, it, the, the gradient is exponential. And so when the gradient is so big, the learning rate has to be really, really small to get convergence. But this means that you will never converge, basically. But if you use gradient clipping, everything is fine. And they showed, theoretically, that if you use gradient clipping with stochastic gradient descent, you can recover convergence in the L0, L1 case. But we can do even better than this. We don't want just to analyze SGD with gradient. We want first to make the assumptions a little bit more refined. And then we want to look at what people actually use, people algorithms like other. So the first thing that we said was to look at single coordinates. You know, the, the, the assumption that I just told you, basically look at the, the entire network as a whole. But you know, the first layer of a networks are very, very different from the last layers of network. They behave in a different ways. And so if we look at the curvature on each single coordinate in different layers, you will observe different things. So this is the curvature in the one coordinate of the decoder of the second layer. And this is the, the, the smoothness in the one coordinate of the decoder in the last layer. Again, you can see that the assumption is true in the sense that you can draw a line and everything is below the line. But the range here is vastly different. This is, uh, this is 10 to the 9 and this is 10 to the 6. So this means that we can look at single coordinate and refine our assumption to say things are different on each single coordinate. And this is what we did. We took the assumption that of from before and now we say the partial uh, derivatives on each single coordinate, when you took their, the, their difference, they are per bounded by a constant that depends on the coordinate, plus a term that is proportional to the partial derivative of the function itself in that coordinate. So now what we are seeing is that the curvature on each single coordinate can increase when we are far away from a local minima, but can, it can increase in a completely different way depending on the, on the coordinates, okay? So we have much more freedom. We can model in much finer way the actual functions that we use. Now, if all these numbers and zero J and then one J are all the same, you recover the same assumption as before. Otherwise, we can model the function in a finer way. And now we look at this thing and we say, okay, can we actually show that now Adam is suited for this class of function that are very, very close to reality? Is it provably better than SGD? And actually the answer is yes and no. So unfortunately we could not analyze exactly Adam. We have to do, we have to do a <coughs> small change to Adam and the small change is here. So Adam has these two terms, a first, what they call the first moment and a second moment. In the second moment, what we had to use here, Adam is using GT squared, so it's using the gradient to calculate the second moment. And instead we had to use the, the first moment itself. Now, what's the reason for this change? 
When you take the add um, update here, so you take the first moment divided by the square root of the second moment, if you do this change, this update will be always controlled, regardless of the noise, regardless of the curvature, that update is always very nice and very well controlled. And this is needed for the theory. And so we could not analyze Adam, we could, uh, we could analyze only this variant. But empirically speaking, these wall rates are basically very, very similar. And you know, if you, if you speak with anyone that is actually doing experiments on, on deep learning and it, you know, it knows deeply these things, they will agree with me that you know, these two algorithms are essentially the same thing. And so what we can prove for this algorithm that we call generalized sine SGT because for a particular setting of beta one and beta two, you get exactly sine SGT. Now we can show this convergence rate that it's particularly scary, but let me decompose it. There are two terms. So this is the gradient and we say the gradient is converging to zero at a certain rate. There are two terms. These first terms, they're standard. They appear in SGD exactly in the same way. They do not matter, okay? The important term is the last one. The last one depends on M. What is M? M is the maximum gradient that you observe on the sub-level sets of the initial point. Okay, let me explain it. You start somewhere, okay? Start from always somewhere in your optimization. You look at the sub-level sets of that initial point. So you look at the, all the function value that has the same value of the initial point, and you look at all the gradients inside here. You take the maximum gradient in this area, and this is what governs the rate. Now, this gradient can be really, really large because these, these functions are not smooth. They, they can be exponential. So this term here can be extremely large. However, it's multiplied by a function that is x to the minus t to the one fourth. So this term is going to zero really fast. So this means that the gradient here can be exponentially large. It does matter. The algorithm will converge anyway. Now, why this is good? Let me compare it with stochastic gradient descent, actually with gradient descent. We have a lower bound that basically says that gradient descent with a constant learning rate will have to pay a factor that depends on the square root of m divided by square root of t. Okay, so here we don't have that exponential term anymore. We just have one over square root of t. This is going to zero really slowly. So this means that if the gradients are big, gradient descent will converge really, really slow. And this is the first time that we can show a gap. We can actually show one is better than the other. At least in one setting, we can say that yes, these two algorithms are actually different. Now, enough with the theory. Let me show you some experiments. So given that the algorithm is not exactly Adam, we had to test it, right? We had to actually see if this is true that it's similar to Adam. So we compare this algorithm with Adam, as we did with the momentum, momentum normalized. SGD with clipping and SGD with clipping momentum, all the possible variants, basically. And we did experiments on CIFAR 10, and this is training loss, test loss. Now, the important line is the black one, that is our algorithm. And you can see that basically the black line is on par or better than all the algorithms. And in particular, it's very, very similar to Adam. So, you know, this validate my claim that this algorithm is basically essentially Adam. It's some, something like a fixed version of Adam that you, know, you can actually analyze in theory. Uh, we did also experiments on LSTM, Pentry Bank, and again, on, on test, the performance of Adam and the performance of this variant are basically the same. And we also did experiments on transformers. And by the way, we were particularly careful on these experiments. So you know, we are using all the tricks that applied people use. So you know, this is a learning rate warm up, cosine decay, really, really all the tricks that people use. Because if you don't use them, then it's particularly easy to show that your algorithm is better than the others. Uh, and again, we have that test accuracy, the black line that is our algorithm and the purple line that is Adam are basically one on top of the other. And I think in this case, we have a tiny advantage over Adam. So final message, this algorithm is basically as good as Adam because they're essentially Adam. And moreover, we can show theoretically that yes, this is better than gradient descent. There is a gap between the two. So take home messages. Smoothness is basically an assumption that is unverified in deep learning. There is no reason to use it apart from the fact that it makes the analysis easy. But you know, you get an easier analysis, but on the other hand, you get an algorithm that it's most of the time useless. So it might be worth exploring better assumptions. 
And for training transformers, we observed that this coordinate-wise relaxed and smoothed assumption does hold. We measured in practice, it holds. And this, under this assumption, generalized SGT has a provable advantage over stochastic gradient descent, and it is very close to us. Okay, so let me just few slides. I'm over time. I'm pretty sure I'm over time. It's about two minutes. <laughs> so, what are the things that I would like to do in the future? So, first, I, I mean, I do put this parameter free. I think this is the future. I really want to work on these things. Uh, so where parameter free is going, the, the thing that I'm most excited is that now there is a small community of people working on this topic. It's not only me, it's a bunch of people that are working on this topic, mainly from online learning, unfortunately. But I started convincing of pure optimization people too. I'm pretty excited about the fact that, you know, optimization people are finally looking at it. This is a cult paper from two pure optimization people at this year they improved my rates. I'm super happy about that. You know, I'm happy that people are starting working in this field. I don't care if they beat me. And, and this is another paper that was presented a few weeks ago in an optimization workshop in Europe. And by the way, Di Fazio is at Facebook and he told me that he's, he's pushing to use these parameter free algorithms in production. So, you know, there is something to it. And there will be a mini symposium a sign opt uh, next year, totally on, on this topic that will try to, you know, to gather people from online learning and from optimization together to discuss techniques. And of course, we want to apply to deep learning. All of us that are working on this field, they really want, want we want these things to work on deep learning. Now, when I say deep learning, I want to be clear that, you know, I don't want just theory. As I said at the beginning, no principal optimization algorithm actually is used in deep learning. So the first thing that we should understand is, is it actually the case that none of the things that people propose work? Or it's just very difficult to convince applied people that you know there are better algorithms than other. And so one thing that I would like to do is assign benchmarks. You know, if you think about computer vision, NLP, even reinforcement learning, people had extremely good benchmark that drove uh, the progress in the field by a lot, year by year. You can basically measure by how much things improve. In optimization for deep learning, we don't have it. You know, people keep proposing new algorithms. I don't know if you follow, you know, the clones of Adam, there are infinite number of clones every year. They are terrible, all of them. And, you know, the, the thing that is missing is that we cannot measure if they're actually better or not. So we, we, I would really like to design benchmarks that tells us, you know, what works and what not. And the other thing is that there are problems in which we don't even know what works and what not because we are not doing that. For example, training very large transformers, think about these massive uh, uh, NLP models. These are so massive that only uh, industry people can train them. So this means that only them know what are the difficulties for these kind of problems. And we have no idea. So if I don't know what are the problems, for sure I cannot solve them. And, and in more generally, I would like to be in a place where a university should, can take a leading role in leading big AI projects again. I mean, in the last few years, universities didn't lead in any way. You know, we were just following what the others were doing. And let me show you something that, you know, uh, shows that this is not impossible. This is doable, you know. Uh, Xinhua University um, published the paper two months ago on archive. This is an open source language, uh, language models, English, Chinese, 130 billion parameters. It took 11 months from the idea to the realization, but they did it. They did the entire pipeline. And it took 60 days just of training. But the interesting thing is that they brought a very detailed log of all the problems that they encountered day by day. And what you see is that every two days of these two months of training, they had to stop the training because the things were diverging. And then there was a human looking at the plots deciding the learning rate by hand, and then resuming the learning rate from the previous checkpoint. So, you know, it's clear that we don't even know that these things do not work because we are not even trying to do that. And so this, this problem would be important first because, you know, academia should lead in this field. We should not leave these things to industry people. And second, this is a gold mine of scientific problems for optimization that, you know, again, we don't know that they, they exist because we don't try to solve them. 
Okay, so to conclude, let me conclude in the same way in which I started. Optimization is the core of all the machine learning algorithms that we use in these days, yet not radical principle algorithms is used in deep learning. And I try to bridge this gap. And in this talk, I show you two examples on how to make optimization algorithms closer to the applied world. And also, I showed you how to optimally bet on a coin. And you know, you never know, it might be useful in your life. Okay, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Any more questions? I think we had a lot, but if anyone has more, it's still like minus five minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> no question, but uh, just coming back to the memory question on the first parameter uh, free right. you know, coin betting algorithm right. you specified, right? So, if I'm understanding correctly, you have, uh, let's say, for an actual implementation, you have the parameter states x, every yeah. optimized algorithm has this. Then you, you keep two running sums. One is the sum of gradients, one is the sum of the inner products, the gradients, and the states, right? So, am I correct to say that therefore the memory requirement is uh, three times that of basic SG? So, that, that one, that one only, only ends the iterates. Um, you don't have to store the iterates. Right. You can produce uh, the iterates every time, every time you need it. You, can only, you only have to store the sum of the gradients and the single numbers. So that is actually less than SGD, but I would not advise to use them. That is a very primitive algorithm in a certain sense. The COCOB one that I that was specific for deep learning, that one was sum of gradients. So that it's basically corresponds to the iterates that SGD is storing. And then you add two or the three additional numbers for each coordinate. Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. Now, so, so it's an order of two to three numbers per coordinate. Right, so. exactly, exactly. Now, I at that time, I was concerned about not adding too many things. But recently, I spoke with uh, you know people at Facebook are on the FATSU. And he told me that it's not a concern anymore. Yeah, it, I agree. It's so, I mean, for example, something like, like for example, Microsoft Zero Optimizer, they, even for something like Momentum SGD, the optimizer size of that is like way bigger than the, than the actual like parameter state. So people are definitely, accounting for it in the design of their, their, their systems, right? That, right. that yeah, you, you, we definitely don't want to be using basic SGD. We, we want to have some additional right. state uh, because it makes the optimizer algorithm so right. much better. And I think uh, if it's basically two to three times that of a, uh, you know, the, 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 the weights of parameters, right? right. That, that should definitely be right. okay. Right. 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 But, but I am also open, you know, Aaron was, for example, telling me that people are now looking at second order algorithms like Shafu and these kind of things. They store way more. Interesting. And they were saying, and he was telling me that, yeah, it's not a problem. People are willing to pay the memory price if they actually see, you know, a, a gain in performance. But I don't know exactly how they, you know, so, they so, things. Right. I, can, I can probably comment a little bit on why they're willing to pay it because now with uh, with systems that can handle. I was talking to you earlier, right? With systems that can handle multiple dimensions of parallelism, data model, and parameter. We have the ability to slice up the, the, the training algorithm very finely. So ultimately, what matters is not the amount of GPU on the amount of memory on a single GPU, it's your aggregate memory across all the GPUs. Uh, that's why people are saying, look, if if show show what if I have a like a, a 50 layer model, if I if I'm going to put if I can put one layer per model, then I have that much more memory to store as much optimizer state as, yeah. as I want to, right? Uh, so in the end, it's also it, it's like trying to, from a system perspective, I always think of it as a trade-off between compute and memory, right? If I can reduce the total compute time by paying more memory, right. uh, then it makes sense to, to do it, especially because I can always get more GPU memory by using more GPUs. Right. The, 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 I think so that's probably where the PyTorch folks' confidence comes from, that, that we're pretty, getting to a point where we're pretty sophisticated at chopping the models up. Okay, thank you. Do you have any more questions? I have a question. Uh, there is a paper by uh, Sanjeev Arora showing that uh, exponentially increasing learning graphs actually work and it's kind of equivalent to uh, weight decay. Yeah, are, you, are you aware of that? Right, yeah. It's only for a particular kind of, uh, it basically looked at the effect of batch normalization. So that paper is specific to that thing and then it's basically analyzing under that particular situation what happens. Yeah, I know that paper. It made a lot of noise, but at the end of the day, I'm not sure that it was actually something that you know, had any effect. Okay. 
So I mean, I think it, it's very and people don't even use batch norm anymore, by the way, in, in transformers. It's, it's another kind of normalization. So, okay, I'll, I'll get it. Any more questions? I know we are a little behind, but it's fine. So it's thanks to Francesco. Let's enjoy the afternoon.